Dabke is a folk dance native to the Eastern Mediterranean. It combines circle dance and line dancing and is widely performed at weddings and other joyous occasions. The line forms from the right to the left where the leader heads the line, alternating between facing the audience and the other dancer. The Palestinian dabka jumps may have origins in ancient Canaanite fertility rites, where the Phoenicians were probably the first teachers of the dance in the world. Generally, ancient dances were connected with religious rituals, a connection that was common up until the 16th century and still continues in some countries. Phoenicia was a seafaring civilization that included the coastal areas of today's Lebanon, northern Israel, and southern Syria. The Phoenician writing system became widely used, spread by Phoenician merchants across the Mediterranean world, where its alphabet evolved and was assimilated by many other cultures. The Old Hebrew Alphabet, also called the Paleo-Hebrew, was adopted by the Greeks around the 12th century BC. While Hebrew is written from right to left, Greek was written from left to right. For this reason, the letters were reversed in the Greek alphabet. Here we see the first five letters of the old Hebrew alphabet. The Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit and He. But when reversed, we see the ancient Greek alphabet. The Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon. Note that the original Hebrew names of these letters were retained for the Greek alphabet. The Aleph becomes the Alpha, the Bet becomes the Beta, the Gimel becomes the Gamma, the Dalet becomes the Delta, and the only exception is the He becomes in Greek E Psalon, which means plain E. Over the centuries, these ancient Greek letters evolved into their modern Greek forms. Our English alphabet is Roman, and because the Romans adopted the Greek alphabet, we are able to see our own modern English alphabet in these ancient Hebrew turned Greek letters. The A, B, C, D, and E. As previously mentioned, the Old Hebrew alphabet was used by all Semitic peoples, including the Arameans, also called the Chaldeans, but evolved independently from the Hebrew. By the 5th century BC, the time of the Israelites' captivity in Aramea, also called Babylon, it no longer resembled the Old Hebrew it came from and it is this Aramaic square script that Israel adopted during their captivity. With the Aramaic square alphabet in use by the Israelites, it continued to evolve into the modern Hebrew letters that we're familiar with today.
According to biblical tradition, Hebrew is a Northwest Semitic language native to an ancient people living in what is now Palestine and Israel, descended from the patriarch Jacob, grandson of Abraham, who is descended from Shem, son of Noah. So both the Greeks and the Medes come from the Indo-European family. The Indo-Europeans stretch from the Indus River in northern India to the Black Sea, and eventually all the way to Ireland. They represent one of the three Caucasian groups. Traditionally, it was taught that there were three Caucasian groups, the first being the Hamite Caucasians, who became known as the Egyptians, the second being the Semite Caucasians, who became known as the Babylonians, Hebrews, Elamites, and Assyrians, and the third being the great Indo-Europeans, or Japhites, also known as the Aryans, which included Northern Indians, Greeks, Medes, Latins, Celts, Germanic races, Slavs and Russians, also known as Scythians. This was taught in schools, universities, and even in church. It's really in the last 150 years that we've seen a major change in the biblical story at the hands of globalization. So the story goes like this. There was a flood in Mesopotamia that wiped out the first great empire known as Sumer. Why did God wipe out Sumer? The common church view is that fallen angels rebelled against God and started having children with earthly women. Now, the second more logical and realistic view that used to be taught in church was Adam's children, the sons of God, began mixing with the primitive tribal people, daughters of man. And after mixing, the offspring from this mixture became incredibly corrupt adopting foreign violent cultures instead of what was originally taught to Adam by God. Noah was only saved because he was culturally, spiritually, and racially pure. In Genesis 6-9, it explains that God spared Noah because he was a just man, genetically perfect, and that he walked with God. We then have Noah's Ark landing on the Caucasian mountains about 4,500 years ago on Mount Ararat which coincidentally is the home of the white race. Noah's three sons and their sons dispersed in different directions from this point. So the old church tradition was that Noah and his sons were the white races. So Noah's sons and grandsons divided and eventually mixed with other people. And so Noah's sons represent the three Caucasian groups. Now, today, the churches teach the whole world was submerged under water and that only eight people survived. Therefore, we are all the product of serious incest. And somehow Noah and his wife gave birth to one pure African son, one pure white son, and one pure Asian son. And we're all somehow related. However, all DNA, all archaeology, linguistics, and even our modern world testifies that exactly where Noah's Ark landed is the exact starting point for the white race. But of course, this view is racist and the modern day church view is more multicultural and therefore it's accepted. The Great Events from Great Historians, a collection from 1905, makes no apologies that Noah and his sons represent the three Caucasian groups. So this was a normal view in white Western Christian nations. Noah and his sons were Caucasian, hence why we call the mountains where Noah landed the Caucasian Mountains. The first three major empires after the flood were the Hittites in Anatolia, Egypt or Mizra, who comes from Ham's son Mizraim, and the Semites from Shem, who ruled Mesopotamia after a Semite named Sargon of Akkad conquered Mesopotamia not long after the Bible says the flood happened. These kingdoms are recorded in secular history, and the Bible fully backs this up. So the Aryans or Indo-Europeans represent the Japhites, and in Greek mythology, Two of the main gods who gave birth to all the gods were Gaia and Uranus, and they gave birth to a god named Iapetus, or Japetus, who was also known as Japheth. He is one of the fathers of the Greeks. The Bible calls the Greeks Javan, who was a son of Japheth. If you go to your Bible concordance, you will see that under Javan, it says Ionian Greek. When we look at language from India to Ireland, we see connections just through the words. 
In Sanskrit, which is Old Indo-Aryan and is the base for the Indian language today, we see similarities when we compare it with Old Persian, Latin, Greek, and even Gaelic. We see some serious connections. From Sanskrit to Old Persian, it's almost identical. Look at the words father, mother, and brother. Even when we compare it to German and English, even when we look at Gaelic, Greek, and Latin, we can see the Aryan roots. So even after thousands of years, we can still see similarities in the languages. Now the first name of the Aryan's country was called Arata. It was in the mountains somewhere near Iran and Armenia, like the mountain Ararat, Arata, where the Bible says Noah's Ark landed and became the name Arya, Aryan, which in Sanskrit, Arya means noble or noble ones. Also, monotheism was apparently common among Aryans who eventually invented Zoroastrianism. Now, Noah wasn't Jewish or Israeli or a Hebrew or a Semite. He was the father of all of them. The Bible tells us that the Phoenicians and the Israelites had trade posts with Javan or the Ionian Greeks and even Tarshish, which is in Spain. We know that they established the great city of Carthage who conquered Spain, which Spain's original name was Iberia, which meant Hebrew. So it was originally called the Hebrew Peninsula. The Phoenicians had trade posts as far as Britain, Denmark, and potentially even the New World. The island in the middle of the Mediterranean bears the Hebrew words Sar Dania, which means rulers of Dan in Hebrew. The tribe of Dan were Viking-like people who had a habit of conquering lands and then renaming it after the father of their tribe, Dan. In Russia, along the Black Sea, they recently found the burial remains of a female Sarmatian warrior. She wore a necklace with either ancient Hebrew or ancient Phoenician written on it. This was found while they were constructing an airport. Elisha was the son of Javan, the fourth son of Noah's son, Japheth, according to the book of Genesis. The Jewish historian Josephus related the descendants of Elisha with the Elonians, one of the ancestral branches of the Greeks, or the ancestor of the Almanim. Almanic German from the territory of Almania, which includes the Swabia region of Germany, is also called High German. Another form being Yiddish, the historical language of the Ashkenazi Jews, a high German-based vernacular fused with elements taken from Hebrew and Aramaic. Live on Channel 5, this is the 10 o'clock news with Deborah Norville. Coming out revealing secret negotiation between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933, which allowed German Jews and their assets to go to Palestine. Rich Samuels joins us tonight with the story of the controversy behind the book and the author's struggle to write it. Rich? Deborah, with the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in the spring of 1933, the Jews of the world were faced with a dilemma. They could raise a cry of protest, a cry few would heed, or they could make a deal with Hitler, a deal that would bring a step closer their dream of an independent Jewish state. American Jews marched calling for the boycott of all German exports. Jews throughout Europe echoed that call, so did Jews everywhere. But a group of Zionists at the same time was quietly negotiating an agreement with the Nazis to allow the immigration of German Jews and the transfer of their assets to Palestine. That deal, reported in August 1933, was the transfer agreement. Palestine, sparsely settled by Jews at the time, was radically changed as a result. I lived in Palestine from 1933 to 1936, and uh, we saw um, every week transports of German Jews coming to settle in Palestine. German Jewish settlement of Palestine was, for a time, official Nazi policy. These photos of Jewish life in Palestine, along with a lengthy text, appeared in 1934 in the Berlin paper Der Angriff. A Nazi visits Palestine was the title of the multi-part series. A medal was struck by Goebbels in commemoration. On one side, the swastika. On the other, the Star of David. Hitler demanded one concession for the transfer agreement, that the call for a boycott of the Reich, raised by Jews here and elsewhere, be rejected by the Zionists. The Zionists made that concession. And so, while Nazis were marching in Germany, 
And while Jews were marching here, diplomacy was running a more important story. In the Mediterranean, where the dream of a nation-state for Jewish people came a step closer to reality. The story in this book some will find hard to accept. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. Thank you for sharing, liking, subscribing, and especially to those who donated to Atlantean Gardens, the nonprofit organization that I contribute these videos to. I always look forward to reading your comments. Even though I don't always get a chance to reply, I do appreciate them. I will see you next time.